It's six o'clock in the evening, and I've just parked at the side of a very busy highway in Florida. I'm meeting some guys named Kevin and Anthony. Ready, Kev? Born and raised. Okay, you want me to drive? It's up to you. Are we going up top? You're going to hop in right now. On top of Kevin's car is an aluminum platform. Whoa, that's dodgy. It covers the whole roof, and it has railings all around to hang on to. I'm supposed to get up on that roof, but there aren't very many ways to do that. Where the hell do you step up onto this thing? Oh, yeah. By the way, uh, no fancy sh- Step on the tire, step on the roof, get the f- here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the guy barking orders is Kevin Pavlidis. He's a bounty hunter, and he's in a hurry. It's very bumpy up here. I'm going to warn you from now. Oh, this is fun. We're on a hunt, and it's one of the more bizarre situations I've ever found myself in. At night, they'll come out to the edge. Is that right? Why? Because that's where the food is. The food Kevin's talking about includes raccoons, opossums, and alligators. And we're here to catch what's eaten them. Burmese pythons. Some of them are monsters up to 20 feet long. They hide in the dense swamps. They swim in the canals and slink up along the levees, concealed in the brush. They're buried up in there, and you'll be going along, and everything looks like grass, and then all of a sudden there's just a dark tube or just a dark spot like that tucked up in the grass. Here in the Florida Everglades, the Burmese python is an animal with a price on its head. It's an invasive species that's close to triggering an ecological collapse. But not if these python hunters have anything to do with it. Stop, python! Oh, python! I thought it was dead, but it might actually be alive. It's yeah. Alive. It's not dead. It's been hit. Oh no. Yep. No, it's alive. No, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. Right. Holy crap, mate. Today, part one of the invasion of the Burmese pythons. From KURW in Seattle, I'm Chris Morgan. Welcome to the wild. We're here uh, in Florida talking about pythons. What do you think about pythons? Oh my God. The pythons and the alligators are crazy. I landed in Miami a couple of days ago and drove north to Fort Lauderdale. I'm on the beach, taking in the Atlantic Ocean. This is the east coast of Florida, a state that reaches down towards the tropics like a giant thumb. There's a guy running a barbecue stand by the beach. Do you like them being around? No. I don't like, I don't like snakes no time at all, man. <laughs> They're crazy, man. Just on the other side of the city, only 20 miles away, are the famous Everglades, python country. But even here, miles away from the entrance to the Everglades, pythons are a big deal. It seems like everyone's heard of them. I spoke with another couple huddled in a gazebo, escaping the rain. So I've got to ask you guys, what do you think of uh, pythons? Pythons uh, just don't want one to eat me. <laughs> pythons? My brother had pythons. I used to hold them. They didn't bother me. They're amazing creatures, aren't they? They are, yeah. They didn't bother me. Florida is snake country. There are over 40 native species here. Compared to just three in my native homeland of the UK, if you've ever compared the weather at those two places, it's easy to understand why. Florida's weather and wetlands are what snake dreams are made of. But Florida is also home to snakes that don't belong here. The native home of the Burmese python is actually southern and southeast Asia, named after Burma, today the country of Myanmar, tucked between India and Thailand. Over there, it makes its home in rainforests, swamps, marshes and grasslands. It's as comfortable in water as it is on land. Successful habitat generalists. It's not surprising Florida feels like home. It's actually home to over 40 invasive snake species. I've got a set of laminated cards here, put out by the government of Florida on some of their non-native snakes. 
Ball python, non-native. Common boa, non-native. Reticulated python, non-native. Green anaconda, non-native. Yellow anaconda, non-native. Or giant snakes that don't belong here. And here's our Burmese python, non-native, invasive, maximum length, 20 feet. Wow. The Burmese python story that's evolved over the last two decades is shocking. They're huge compared to the native snakes in Florida. They can measure up to 20 feet and weigh 200 pounds, more than double the size of the largest native snake. In fact, they are one of the top five biggest snakes on earth. The females lay up to 100 eggs, and they eat just about everything, from animals as small as a mouse to as big as a bobcat or an alligator. To date, no human has ever been killed by a wild living Burmese python in Florida, but it's not impossible. These snakes are found in suburban areas around humans, and they've certainly killed their fair share of cats and dogs. The first Burmese python in the Everglades was documented in the late 70s. It wasn't until the mid-90s that they started seeing them on a regular basis and recognizing that they were multiplying. The python numbers just kept growing. And uh, here we are today. We're in a, an emergency for our, our native wildlife here. Mike Kirkland is a senior invasive animal biologist at the South Florida Water Management District, a government agency in charge of all things water, which in the Florida Everglades is almost 5 million acres of subtropical wilderness. You wouldn't imagine how much trouble that they caused down here. In fact, when I first came to the Everglades, I thought that there was room for another apex predator in the Everglades. And now look at me, this has consumed my life and I was, couldn't have been more wrong. Mike remembers the first time Burmese pythons came onto his radar at work, about six years ago. Our executive director at the time saw a video of a python holding an alligator underwater and drowning it. And the video went viral in January of 2017. It is a battle of life and death, a rarely recorded glimpse at a Burmese python, an unwelcome addition to the Everglades, taking on the native alligator. Man, I can't believe that snake is dominating the alligator like that. This is incredible. I couldn't believe it. And he called our bureau chief upstairs and said, hey, we need to do something about this, um, this problem. I know just what to do. His idea was to give 25 people unprecedented access to the Everglades, bounty hunters. And so our bureau chief came down with these marching orders and um, asked, who's the snake guy of the group? And, and uh, he said, well, I think Kirkland's interested in snakes. And they, they really didn't know. But uh, they, they put me into a, a small conference room and they gave me this idea. You want me to go and be in charge of a bunch of fellow snake catchers in the Everglades? And... I thought I might as well have won the lottery. The South Florida Water Management District willing to pay 25 people to help capture the invasive species as part of their pilot python elimination program. At the time, and still today, anyone can kill a python. Some people have practically made it a pastime. But Mike's official team gets paid for it. In addition to an hourly rate, each bounty hunter is paid by the foot. The first four feet of snake is worth $50, then every additional foot is $25 after that. So a big one can pull in over 400 bucks, and their job is to capture and euthanize as many Burmese pythons as they can. The python elimination program was only supposed to be a three-month trial. That was six years ago. It's now expanded to 50 contractors, and Mike's devoted his life to the effort of removing Burmese pythons from the Everglades. I measure time now in um, BPP and APP, before Python program and after. And um, my life will never be the same since I've started doing this. In addition to Mike's 50 contractors, another organization called the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission has 50 more. So a total of 100 people given keys to the Everglades. Literally, real keys that open gates to places no one else is allowed to go to catch and kill pythons. So I'm heading to meet 
Anthony and Kevin, two snake hunters. They dropped me a pin, and uh, it is literally right on the edge of civilization, <laughs> where the metropolis ends and snake country begins. Anthony Flanagan and Kevin Pavlidis are two of the most skilled python hunters on Mike's team. Good morning, you all. Good morning, Good morning guys. Up in your vehicle and follow me to where we're heading. This is Anthony. I follow him a few miles to where he hopes to catch some pythons today. We pull over and I clamber on top of his high truck platform to start our search. Yeah, so the golden rule when we're moving, hold on. Always hold on. Anthony's 50 years old. He's been hunting pythons for 15 years. He started even before Mike's official program began. And he's caught a grand total of over 900 of these massive invasive snakes. Mike says Anthony is one of his most valued hunters. We call Anthony Flanagan the OG, the original gangster. And he is uh, really a python whisperer. He doesn't have, uh, you know biology degree uh, like like I do, um, but he has gotten this down to a science. How does that tally with other people, other hunters? Puts them at the very, very top. This is a very good location. I've caught over 100 pythons off of this one stretch. This location is classic Everglades. We're on a narrow road, what they call a levee, raised up next to a canal. And as far as I can see, there are vast expanses of marsh and tall sawgrass on either side of us. The area you're going to want to look is where the low grass meets the, the taller sawgrass and stuff right on that edge, kind of like where my hand shadow is down there. Uh, the snakes will actually come out and like hang just a coil out mm -hmm. when it's visible. So hold on. All right, Dad. It's a family affair for Anthony. His dad is driving to help him out. We inch forward slowly on idle and start looking for snakes as thick as my thigh. It's a hot day, over 80 degrees and muggy. The sun is beating down, there are flies all around, and every so often we have to avoid poisonous overhanging trees. But we've got our eyes peeled from high up on the platform on top of the truck. See if you see that right there? That indentation in the yeah. rocks, that little flat spot, uh -huh. that's from a python. Is that right? Yeah, that's from one that's been basking. How can you tell? You can just tell by the way it's matted, like in the little tunnel at the back, where the snake kind of climbed out and coiled and basked. There's, you was, call them pads, that's what Yeah, we call them yeah, beds. basking pads or breeding pads. That's a basking pad. That's a huge snake that made that Oh, no, that that's spot. probably, yeah, that's, but that's eight, nine feet maybe. Oh, it's a tiddler. Oh, that's a, yes, it's a, <laughs> that's a little, little <laughs> tiny thing. The Everglades is one big wetland full of life. They cover an area 60 miles wide and 100 miles long. In fact, it's one of the largest wetlands on Earth. It's the source of water for over 8 million people. A mixture of marshes, little raised island forests called hammocks, pine, cypress trees and mangroves. It's incredibly productive habitat and home to everything from turtles and bears to spoonbills and Florida panthers. 2,000 species of plants and animals in all, including 78 that are threatened or endangered. It's a subtropical wildlife paradise and just perfect for snakes, like the ones who've made it home here. Along with OG Anthony and his dad, there's another champion python hunter, Kevin Pavlidis. Kevin is one of Anthony's protégés and um, is also one of the, the very best python hunters in the world. Kevin actually caught the longest python in South Florida, 18 feet, nine and a quarter inches. I actually have that capture footage uh, on my YouTube channel, Snakeaholic. Kevin's one of those larger-than-life characters. He's 25 years old, and when he's not out catching Burmese pythons, he's an alligator wrestler at a local tourist attraction. Oh, I would love to see and, that. Uh, yeah. It's... Snakeaholic. Yeah. Oh, what a great, great name. If it can kill me, I want to play with it. <laughs> I don't think that he drinks nearly as much caffeine as I do, but I don't know where his energy comes from. It's just, you know, another very passionate person. So, Kevin, can you describe what you're looking for in here? Anything, honestly. 
the way that we typically phrase it is anything that's out of place. Anything that doesn't look like Everglades. We yep. duck our heads down low to avoid the poison wood branches. This is serious business. Invasive species are one of the top five conservation problems in the world. When species that don't belong in a particular ecosystem start to multiply, they can have disastrous effects. And here, it's seen in what the pythons eat. You know, we're seeing a 95% reduction in fur-bearing animals in Everglades National Park, the surrounding natural areas. I challenge you even to go to Everglades National Park and find a single fur-bearing animal, a single squirrel, raccoon, fox, possum, deer. Um, doing nothing is not an option. Ecologists and people like Mike, Anthony and Kevin on the front lines feel like it's only a matter of time before the house of cards comes tumbling down. Because the snakes are eating so many native prey species that other native predators need to eat. Not to mention the fact that the pythons occasionally eat endangered species too. So it's become a multi-million dollar year-round effort with federal and state funding to rid the Everglades of the pythons. To have a good chance at catching one of these huge constrictors, you need the proper hunting ingredients, like the best location to look? East, where the sun is beating down. The pythons will often slither up out of the canal and bask in the sun in the wintertime for warmth, like now in February. It's the perfect scenario for escape route for a big female with deep water, some vegetation along the edge for them to feel concealment and safety. It's dry ground for basking. It's a corridor for forage to walk along for them to feed. And it's because it is east facing, it heats up quickest on winter days when it's really cold. Burmese pythons are called constrictors because they wrap their bodies around their prey, squeezing it to death, just like a boa constrictor does. They can live to be 25 years old. They're only a couple of feet long when they're born, but in their first year, they can grow to be seven feet. But even when you're looking in the right spots, finding them is still a struggle. And because they're so hard to find, Mike says it's impossible to actually know how many pythons are out there. Our biggest management obstacle for them is detection. Because they're so hard to detect, they're so cryptic, they're so well camouflaged in the environment, um, coupled with the um, vastness and relative inaccessibility of Everglades, we can't do a conventional population estimate on the species. You hear numbers thrown out there, like 100,000 or a million. Uh, we just don't know. Pythons have long, slick bodies. Their skin is covered in intricate rhythmic patterns, full of blacks, browns, and yellows. They blend in with the sawgrass perfectly, so much so that you can have a python two inches away from your face and not even see it. Yeah, actually we had one like that this year, where, uh, just found a, a patch of really, really thick grass. And I got out and started walking around in it. And as I was walking, all of a sudden I just heard. <laughs> what was that? That's what I wanted to find out. Oh. So I was like, what made that noise? And I'm like, well, I don't know what I'm standing on, but it doesn't feel like grass. It's like harder. So I started bouncing up and down on it, kind of wiggling over it. And I just turned and yelled up to Anthony. I was like, hey, Ant, I don't know what I'm standing on, but it's not grass, <laughs> and I don't want to get off of it until I have backup, <laughs> uh -huh. just in case. And he came down there, and sure enough, I was standing on a 13-footer. Really? Yep. But it's interesting, too, in those scenarios, you'd think they would take off, but if the grass is thick enough, most of the time they sit perfectly still mm. as a reflex and hope that you get off of them and walk away. Right, they're just relying on their camouflage, huh? Yeah. It's incredible how quickly they can disappear. They lie in the brush, waiting, or they actively stalk their prey. A body that has taken 15 million years to evolve to help them succeed. The snake feels even the tiniest of vibrations in the ground from a passing target like a bird or a mammal. Then it pinpoints the prey, with chemical receptors in its tongue. Sensors along the snake's jaw detect heat, 
Then boom, the snake strikes, grabbing its prey with rows of sharp teeth. Two rows on the top, one row on the bottom, a hundred or more of them. But they're not venomous. Once they've grabbed the prey, they use their long body and wrap it around the victim and squeeze. Every time the victim exhales, the python squeezes tighter until the prey is basically suffocated. Then their jaw stretches wide to swallow their meal whole. One of Kevin's techniques for spotting them is to look for a glisten on their skin. Their skin is extremely iridescent, so it gives off a very distinct bluish shimmer shine to it. Mm. And, um, you know, we're in full sunlight. Sometimes they're absolutely glowing, just beaming in the sun. Even though they are huge and stronger than a wrestler, these snakes depend on their stealth, so camouflage is key. As we drive the levee, eyes peeled. Anthony tells me what happens after they catch their prey. They're very tactile, you know, whatever brushes up against them or gets within striking range, they'll make a grab. Have you ever seen a snake with a hefty lump in the middle of its body? Oh, yes. Yeah? Oh, absolutely. And sure. what was it, do you think? Uh, well, I know from the snakes regurgitating them after I captured them, um, it's been everything from opossums to birds to rats. Uh, Did you say when you caught one, it regurgitated? Mm -hmm. Is that is that that's a that's a natural that? that's a natural defense mechanism. When an animal has just eaten, and especially if it's a very large prey item, mm -hmm. the snake w is vulnerable. It can't move quickly. It it can't slink through vegetation quickly. Um, because it has a big lump in its body. Right. So if it gets threatened by imminent danger, it naturally will regurgitate what it has eaten so that it can move quicker and escape. It strikes me how difficult the hunting is. I half expected to be jumping on a snake every 10 minutes from the stories I'd heard. But even with two of the top python hunters in Florida, these snakes are remarkably elusive. After two different locations and six hours of searching, no luck. It turns out that this snake hunting is not as easy as I expected. I think these guys are too good at it. There's no snakes. You've caught them all, Kevin. Working on it. So we make a plan. We're going to regroup tonight. Anthony sends us another location pin. This time, the edge of a busy highway running east to west across the Everglades. We'll meet there, we'll hunt from 5.45 till about maybe 8.45. Perfect. And then we'll call it. After the break, the night hunt. Every night when it's time to go home from work, Mike Kirkland leaves his office, heads home, and parks himself in his home office. So you can see we've got one, two, three, four five contractors in the field right now. He's got a computer screen displaying a map of the Everglades with little tiny dots moving around on the screen. Those are his python hunters. He can track them through an app on their phones. I have to say I'm not a sports fan, so you know I don't watch football, but when I go home, this is a game I turn on and I just watch dots move around the Everglades. His phone is always on. He says he often responds to hunters in danger faster than 911. He makes himself available to his team 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mike tells me one of his hunters called him once while wrestling a huge python on his own in the swamp. Mike was too far away to help. But like an emergency switchboard, he quickly checked his map, found another python hunter nearby, and deployed him to rescue the fellow who was thrashing around with the snake. It all worked out thanks to Mike. I have worked in the... Everglades for about 17 years or so, and a lot of the time was by myself. And I would remark when I would get back late at night or early in the morning, nobody's checking to see if I got back safe or anything like that. And I always told myself back then, uh, if I'm ever in a leadership position, I'm going to make sure that, you know, that I don't fall asleep until everybody's in. I head back to my rendezvous with hunters Anthony and Kevin. So we weren't able to catch a snake this afternoon with the guys, but we're going back out this evening. It's about 5.30 now. Sunset is about 6.15. So we're hoping 
that because it's been such a hot day, the snakes weren't out. It was too hot even for a snake today. So now, darkness approaching. We're hoping the snakes will be out and give us another chance to catch one. So that's the dream. We're feeling hopeful. It's dark, and we're on the side of a busy highway, slowly driving the grassy verge. Kevin's got huge lights attached to the railings on the top of his car, pointed straight at the sawgrass along a canal. Anthony's eyes are glued to the ground, but while he's scanning, he shares something with me that I wasn't expecting. He tells me he has cancer. He says he had a chemotherapy session just yesterday. It's why his dad was out driving for him today. They gave me two to three years to live with the cancer, so we'll see how that works. It's been really? seven Seriously? months. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, but you're not doing what you love for as long as you possibly yeah. can by the looks of things. Huh? Yeah, you know, it's a little combination of that and trying to pay the bills. With no other form of income, Anthony says he's out here a lot more than some other hunters. It's also what's made him so good at this. I really have to get out here even on unideal days and, and try. And that's how you get good, because when you look for them under ideal conditions, anybody can find them. But what do you do if it's raining? What do you do if it, if it is a cold front coming through? All these kind of things you have to learn. After another hour of scanning the edge. Stop, Python! Oh! Python! I thought it was dead, but it might actually be alive. I can hardly believe it. There it is. A huge python yeah. coiled up on the side of the road. Yeah. No, it's oh, alive. It's, alive. it's alive! It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! I jump off the truck. Kevin tells me to be fast before she has a chance to disappear or strike. You're gonna have to grab it right behind the head. And to grab her behind her head so she can't twist and bite me. So I dive in. Okay, I got it. I got it. Grab the snake. Holy smoke! Look at that wrapping around me already. My heart's pounding, and as I lift her up, she starts to react. She's going a little crazy now. That's unbelievable. She's looking for something to wrap around. Look at that. She had my leg and my, uh, my wrist earlier on. She's getting really, really... That is unbelievable just to feel the strength in her body as she's raising up off the ground like that. She's over 10 feet long. I guess she weighs over 30 pounds. Can I stand up with her? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, she is heavy. Oh, my goodness. As I hoist her up, I notice something in the middle of her body. A big lump, like the size and shape of an American football. We find out later that the bulge in her stomach is an opossum. You can kind of hear that hollow sound of her belly when I tap it gently. That's the, that's the creature inside. A native species that's important food for so many creatures in the Everglades. She had swallowed the opossum whole and was digesting it when we found her coiled up on the ground. Oh, I could feel her digestion go in there. She's got like air pockets down through her belly. This was actually eaten during the day today. And that's why the snake was out, is because the snake was actually trying to catch some of that evening sunshine, that afternoon sunshine, to heat up to help digest this big prey item that's in here. Oh. Normally, you'd It's a strange moment. Like My adrenaline is still pumping. I can't believe I'm holding such a magnificent creature. A muscular body squeezing my arm so tight, it's about to cut off the circulation. She's like some mythical serpent in my hands, powerful beyond belief. But it's also her last day of life. It's not her fault she ended up here. But then Kevin reminds me of the bigger picture. This is the last animal that he is going to eat from our Everglades ecosystem, and that's what it's all about, man, is just protecting but how, native animals. But how does it make you feel on the other side of things as somebody who loves snakes? You're looking at this creature, it's just exquisite in every way, isn't it? It yeah. is a feat of evolution, this thing, looking at it. It's always bittersweet because I've loved Burmese python since I was a child, and you really have to choose because if you leave them alone, the native animals die. Right. If you remove them, you have to kill the invasives, right. but there's no solution where nothing dies. It was amazing to hold her there, feel the weight of her in my arms. But you can't help but think about what's going to happen next. The end of her life. But another threat to the Everglades removed. We carefully place her in a bag. And the last thing you're going to let go of is the head and just plop it in there. And we're going to tie this up nice and tight. 
we're gonna grab that second bag and hold that open for me. Okay, the second bag. That all to the bottom. <sighs> the bag goes in the lock box, so we're full legal and in compliance with all of our permits and everything. We pile on top of the car again for the ride back, wind in our ears, reflecting on the day we've just had, and the lives of hundreds of thousands of snakes that the hunters want out. Um, the resiliency is incredible, like they can take a beating and keep on ticking. Yeah. In fact, that one from tonight was scarred up pretty good. Um, it had, even at, at its age, that snake was probably five years old. What would it be scarred from? Uh, could be from with alligators. It could be from when it was young and it was dealing with rats and things that bit it. And, you know, and as it grows, those scars get larger. Yeah, um, tough life they have, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's it's not easy out here. There's a tough kind of resilience in Anthony too, and a dedication that Mike says runs deep. I've learned a lot about Anthony through some of the health issues that he's dealing with. And I'm at first I'm telling him, hey, you know. You don't need to be out in the field tonight. I, I want you to stay home and rest. But but he never followed that advice. And then suddenly it just clicked. This is what he does. And, you know, for him to be stuck at home, would would that would be the thing that would kill him in the end. As we pull up to the parking lot after the night hunt and we're about to say goodbye, Anthony pulls out his phone. These are pretty much, as you see, these are all snake pictures. As he scrolls through, one after the other, after the other, it seems like every single picture on his camera roll has a snake in it. There's a great deal of pride in him. He's helping this ecosystem that he loves, even if it is tinged with a little sadness. That's amazing seeing all those pictures strung together like that. Oh, yeah. You know, this, this is the, just... the real deal, the daily thing for you. Yeah, this is so, I mean, as you see, it's it's just, all it is is snakes. It's just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of snakes. I wonder if he feels like he's making a difference. Um, I think in localized levees, we're maybe putting a dent. But um, I've been finding them and, and removing them from the wild for 14 years, and the numbers don't seem any different to me. Kevin and Anthony and Mike, their lives are devoted to this Python program. I can see it takes not just skills and stamina, but an ability to focus on the bigger picture. It's a lot to get my head around. The problem, the people devoted to fixing the broken ecosystem, the future. So, like, personally, what, what's your relationship with, with this snake, with, with the, the Burmese Python? This project has really consume me and um it's become part of my identity even and same with a lot of the hunters you know we but um if i could get rid of all the pythons today i would and i don't have any tattoos but if i ever got one it would have to be of the burmese python and uh, i look forward to the day when um you know they're not in, in the wrong place like they are here. So where did these snakes come from? And how did they get here? Exotic pet trade in general is a huge business. It's a multi-billion dollar business. And Miami is um, really ground zero in the United States for the import of exotic pets. Coming up on part two of Invasion of the Burmese Python, we'll dig into what brought them here in the first place the exotic pet trade, plus how science is being used to try and solve what seems like a losing battle. Next time on The Wild. If you want to see that incredible 10-foot Burmese python we captured, we've made a short behind-the-scenes film to share with you, produced by Paul Bikus. There's a link in our show notes. And as always, there are some pretty eye-opening photographs and clips on Instagram at The Wild Pod and mine at Chris Morgan Wildlife. Special thanks to Travis Scott. The Wild is inspired not just by nature, but by the people who work in it, love it, protect it. 
The Wild is a production of KUOW in Seattle and me, Chris Morgan, with support from Wildlife Media. Our producers are Lucy Suchek and Matt Martin. Jim Gates is our editor. A very special thank you for their kind financial support to Jill and Scott Walker, Rose Letwin, Ellen Ferguson, Anna Kimball, John Taylor, Paul Lister, Mark Wilkins and Rebecca Badger, Bob Yellowlees, Barbara Stolman, and Annie Myers. Our production team includes Paul Bikis, Juan Pablo Chiquiza, April Craig, Michaela Giannotti Boyle, Tatiana Latre, Cara McDermott, Darcy Riggin Schmidt, and Brendan Sweeney. Our theme music is by Michael Parker. I'm Chris Morgan. If you enjoy the wild, please spread the word. We tell these stories to reach and inspire as many people as possible. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>